Hey students, I thought I'd put together a little video doing some examples. I know that um, I did a, uh, a bunch of examples in the video lecture, and so some of these I'm sure I covered, but I don't believe all of them, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just sit down and, and do them, and maybe I'll split this into about two pieces, because it'll probably take an hour to do these four, and then we'll make that another hour. So here's my, here's my hope here in this video. Let's uh, look at the um, example calculations. Uh, and I'm pretty sure these first four are mirrors, and these are probably lenses, but there might be some kind of overlap here. But anyways, let me try 15, 16, 26, and 33, and we'll do this, this other part of the list um, on a second uh, video, so it's not all uh, too long here. And in fact, I went ahead and I printed each of these questions, and so here are the four questions, 15, 16, 26, and 36. So let me begin with 15, and I guess I'll also begin with a little... Um, lecture, mini lecture, summary, uh, if you will. Uh, keep this in mind that when we're working with the mirrors um, and the lenses, what was really nice is that this same equation, 1 over P, that's the object distance, and 1 over Q, the image distance, equals 1 over the focal length. And that equation is true for both mirrors, you actually might say all three mirrors, a flat mirror, a concave mirror, and a convex mirror. It also work, works for all of our lenses, our convex lens and our concaves, or any kind of a hybrid of the two, like the uh, convex concave one. Um, and then, of course, which one has more curvature, it would either be more concave than convex, or vice versa, and so, it was, you know, a lot of combinations thereof. But the point is, this equation works. Now, what is a little bit of a hassle, you have to remember when Q is positive and negative, and the hard one, when is P positive and negative, and F, when is it positive and negative. And the other equation, the lateral magnification, is minus Q over P. And so this is universal, and so hopefully what you'll see in these next eight problems that I do although just four in this video, you will see that I'm constantly using those. Doesn't matter whether I have a mirror or lens, I'm just going to use those same equations. Now, there is some differences. For example, the focal length of the mirror is its radius divided by two, and then we also have to keep track of plus and minuses. Uh, whereas the lens, the light is controlled not by reflection, but by refraction. And so one factor is what is the lens made out of and the other two factors are the two curvatures that make up the lens. And then, of course, we've got to keep track of these rules. Uh, we also, when we derived this, said this would only work for lens that are thin, because we made an approximation that the two surfaces, there wasn't much space between them. Uh, and also that the light started in air and went to air. So, so this, to be used for the focal length of the lens, is... Not really universal, but it's very common. A lot of our lenses are relatively thin, and they are also uh, starting to air on one side and going to the other. Uh, perhaps not every situation, but many situations. Okay, so that's kind of my first review, the mathematical review. The other one is kind of draw some pictures of our mirrors. If you kind of remember, if we have this concave mirror, so we'll kind of put a dotted line down the axis of symmetry. We'll call that the optical axis, and I'll put a little focal length here, which, as we said, would be half the radius of curvature. But let me also do the radius of curvature. So, in other words, two focal lengths out. Because if I were to put an object greater than two focal lengths, and also look at all three cases uh, that can occur for this type of concave mirror, we can have our object, like I said, greater than two focal lengths, uh, between one focal length and two, or within one focal length. And if you do that, and you can also kind of See this back here with the mathematics. But I'll draw the rays. This would bounce off and go through the focal point, And the one going through the focal point 
would bounce off. And so what you would get is an image that is upside down and smaller. And like I said, if you look at the math, you can, you can kind of see that. If P is pretty big, uh, maybe I'll write Q this way, Q equals. And so you would take the 1 over F, and you're going to subtract off the 1 over P, and then you're going to take the uh, reciprocal. But you can, you can begin to see then that if this 1 over P is so small because P is so great, greater than, you know, 2, so there's kind of a magical cutoff here at 2F. Uh, let's just talk about 2F. If you had 1F minus 2F, you're left with a 1, uh, uh, one half, or if, if you take 1 over F and subtract 1 over 2F, you get left with then 1 over 2F. And so you take the reciprocal, you got 2F. And so if the object is right here at 2Fs, then you get an image that's right here. And for any then number that would be greater than 2F, so this gets bigger, then this has to get smaller because you're subtracting that. And so it would be in between here. In fact, the smallest it would ever get is when P gets out here to infinity, then your focal length, uh, your Q would actually be your focal length. And so kind of imagining uh, your object starting here and your image here, and then as this moves out, your image moves in. Because remember, uh, we kind of did this with the camera. These two change in opposite numbers so that the focal length would stay the same. Um, anyways, uh, because of this magnification and Q then always being smaller than P, we're going to get something then, and both of them being positive, we're going to get something that's negative, so it's upside down, and we're going to get something less than 1. And so that was my argument here. Now, the reverse is also true, and it's just the same math in reverse, that if you were to put the object between one focal length and two, the image is then going to, again, be upside down, but the image distance Q is going to be greater than 2F. And so the math is exactly the same. And of course, up here now, you will have Q bigger than P, so this number will still remain negative because it was a positive, but it'll be greater than 1. And that's why your, your textbook doesn't call these two different cases. Your textbook calls that just one case, uh, kind of where the object and image reverse roles mathematically. And that's true, but I like to call it two cases, meaning that with this uh, scenario here, I can make a real image upside down and smaller. Here, I can make a real image upside down and bigger. And so those are kind of two different scenarios to me. And now, the third scenario with this lens, or excuse me, mirror, is a little different because we're so close that we the second ray, I'll draw the first one that hits the mirror and goes through the focal point. But the second one, you don't really draw from the object through the focal point because it never hits the mirror. But you can draw it at the same angle, hitting the mirror as if it came from the focal point. And that one then would go parallel. And so these two beams diverge, so they never converge. And that's why your image is not over here, but your image has the appearance of being right here. And since it's angled up, this is always going to be bigger. And it's always going to be upright. And the Q is always going to be negative. So you can see here with a negative Q, with the negative in front, makes the whole magnification positive. And so your this scenario is going to make an upright image. And then you can also see here in the math that the Q is always going to be greater than the, the P here when you, you plug in a P that is less than F. Anyways, and so you always get a magnification that is greater than 1. So you get a virtual image. It's right side up, and it's magnified. Now, the last combination. And so what I call kind of the boring mirror is to have it curve the other way, convex mirror, because then here is the focal point, and it's a, kind of a virtual focal point. Here's the radius of curvature, or two focal lengths, and you can only put the objects, you know, out here. You can't get it, you know, <laughs> past this virtual focal point here. It makes it makes no sense. Uh, so with that in mind, there's only one scenario, 
and with this one scenario and treating f as a negative number, you would come over to something like this, treating f as a negative number with that negative one over p, this lens is then, or mirror, excuse me, is always then going to make a negative Q there. And these negatives just build on each other. And so, in other words, if P was really far away, the position of the image is at the focal point. And then as it gets closer, because this is negative, you have, you know, kind of a double negative. And, of course, then these two add together. And then you take the reciprocal, that makes it even smaller, so that means the image is going to be formed, you know, somewhere less than F. And you can see that in the ray diagram here. If you draw a ray that is headed towards this virtual focal point, of course it never gets there because it bounces off and goes parallel. Or the one that is parallel, and I probably should have drawn this one first, this is the easy one bounces off as if it comes from the focal point. And that's our definition of a focal point, and in this case, a virtual focal point. But you can kind of see then these two rays are diverging out, and so the appearance of these rays, of where they're coming from, would be back here somewhere. And so it's from inside and smaller. And so there is our virtual image. It's right side up and it's smaller. But uh, I hope I didn't lecture too much saying these are the four cases. But you should keep that in mind of the conceptual idea of these lenses as we tackle these problems and uh, trying to figure out what we can get out of it. So finally, let's actually start these. Okay, so number 15. It says here, an object that is 10 centimeters tall is placed at the zero mark of a meter stick. All right, so if I have a meter stick here, and I'll call that the zero mark, I'm going to put an object right here, and of course they say it is 10 centimeters tall. All right, da 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 da. A spherical mirror is located at some point on the meter stick. Okay, so somewhere in here there's a mirror, so it's gonna come in and bounce off the mirror. But we don't know where. And it creates an image of the object that is upright, and notice the four is smaller, and located at 42. All right, so let's see. Roughly in my picture, uh, I guess, That'd be midpoint of about 50, so maybe 42 would be right here. So let's put a dotted line because, again, they don't tell me whether it's concave or convex yet, so I don't want to indicate which it is. I just know it's positioned right about there. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not my bad. That's not where the mirror goes. Sorry, 42 is where the image is, right? Let me read it again. Spherical mirror located, meter stick. The image is located. Okay, so it's upright, it's four tall, and it's at 42. So let me just make kind of a shorter one right there, okay, and then ignore this. But notice it's smaller and upright, and so if we come back to this little mini lecture we talked about, the case that would make it upright and smaller is right here. So we must have a convex uh, mirror, and since the convex one always makes it virtual, then the spherical mirror must be somewhere about here. So something less than the 42. So 42, and then this is something less than 42. So I know the mirror would go right here. And I guess I could bend it this way because I know it's convex from the conceptual answer. In fact, that's the first part of this. Is the mirror convex or concave? And I guess technically I've already answered it, but I think they want you to kind of prove that. And so let's maybe work through the math, and this maybe would help well, kind of our discussion because I drew the ray diagram and just kind of pointed to the math. I didn't actually do the math. So let me do the math. I guess kind of the 
first thing I would do is to say the magnification is the height of the image compared to the height of the object. And so that is a plus 4 over a 10. And notice I put plus 4 because they said it was upright. And that was our definition of a positive H prime. And of course, that's supposed to equal then to a minus Q over P. And uh, this part, I'll just kind of pause and say, okay, uh, this distance, um, where's my red pen here? So this right here would be the P, and this right here would be the, the Q. Okay, however, keep in mind that uh, the absolute value of these two added together gives me that, because this is going to be a negative number here. Okay. Uh, and in fact, that's kind of what I... I want to uh, kind of address here that what we can always say then, and depending on how you want to write this, uh, it might be easier to see if I had an image that was on, well, this side. Let me kind of pick on one that's, that's on this side. Let's come back to this, this first one here, okay? If I were to call this then a P, and of course then this is a Q, and both of them are positive, the difference between them, a P minus a Q, represents how far apart is the object and the image. Uh, let me call it delta for a moment here. So that would be their, their difference. And the neat thing about this geometry uh, which also works for negative numbers. If we had something like this, we again would come up with a formula as P minus Q is the delta because we'd be treating Q on this side as a negative number, meaning we would take this value P and we would take the absolute value of Q, which is the negative of Q. And so the difference between the object and the image is always the same mathematical formula. This would be P minus Q also. And then over here, same thing. P minus Q would be delta. So it doesn't really matter which scenario we have here. So if we still don't know whether it is a concave or a convex mirror, we at least know this, that the P minus the Q has to be 42. That's where they tell us the image is. And uh, maybe I'd better double check. Yeah, see, the image is upright. It is four centimeters tall, and it is located at 42. And again, what's really nice about this rules that are kind of a pain to learn, when is P and, and Q positive and negative, when is F and R positive and negative, uh, when is H and H prime positive and negative? They're kind of a pain, but they're really nice because mathematically, it doesn't matter which scenario you have, and you can just kind of work through the, the formula. So again, if I didn't know that this had to be convex, I, I could still be asking myself, well, is it or is it not? But what I would have is, uh, of course, these two mathematical uh, equations and I can solve for P and for Q. And, and well, let me go ahead and, and, and do that then. Uh, but maybe I will do this. I will take P and in place of minus Q, so there's a minus Q, I'll move the P over there. This would be 0.4P. And I guess it would be plus 0.4 because the negative Q is a plus 0.4P. And so this would become 1.4p equals 42. And then grabbing my calculator, I could then take the 42 and divide it by 1.4 and get 30, which one would make q 
B. Make sense? Oh, yeah, because it's negative. Yeah, sorry about that. So 30, and then I'll bring this over here. Minus the 42, bring that other one to the other side, is a negative 12. Yeah. Okay. I was really worried there. I was thinking in absolute values again. And that can throw you off. And, and so sure enough, you, you know, take that number, and then you subtract its negative. Those add up to 42. And then sure enough, if I do, divide these two... And then take the negative of that. So there's the 12 and divided by 30. Is that 0.4? Yeah, good. So that's perfect. But then if I take 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F, which I like to write this way, the inverse of P plus the inverse of Q, the inverse of all that is F, we'll be able to see if we get a positive or a negative number here. And this is the part that I really wanted to show you mathematically. This is the part where I said, you know, yeah, it's kind of a pain to memorize all these pluses and minuses, but the real advantage now is mathematically, if we don't know what kind of mirror we have or if we're designing something, if we don't know what mirror we need after we go through the math, if we then show that F has to be a positive or a negative number, that will tell us uh, what we need. And so let me, you know, give this a try. So there's the 30, the reciprocal. And let me add that to the negative 12 for the Q and the reciprocal. I'll hit enter. And then finally, the reciprocal of that. And I get a focal length then of negative 20, and all my units have been centimeters. But the real key here is I have just found out that the focal length is negative, and therefore it must be the scenario that we really already know that it must be convex. And so I have a feeling that's what your author was kind of thinking about for you to do, was to run through the math and see if your F came out to be positive and negative. And so there's your answer for convex. Of course, it also says then where is the mirror, which we could do from any of these scenarios. Since we've got P equal to 30, the mirror must be at the 30 centimeter mark on the meter stick, which of course would put it 12 away from where the, the image is. And uh, what is the mirror's focal length? Well, I guess I answered that in the process of going through the math. And so the focal length is a negative 20. And for that matter, the radius of curvature, at least the absolute value, is 40. So if you're trying to buy this, you would ask for a, you know, a radius of 40. Actually, you would, you would ask for it in the catalog as a negative 40 because it you know, fits this convex idea. Okay, so check on number 15. Hopefully that was somewhat helpful. Um, I'll move on to number 16 here. So number 16 says we have a dedicated, and that's an understatement. I mean, watch what this person's going to do. A dedicated sports car enthusiast is going to polish the inside as well as the outside of the hubcaps. <laughs> so, you, you know, I get polishing the outside, so it looks real cool, but not sure about the inside, but trying to make everything, both inside and outside, look great. So inside um, and outside surfaces of the hubcap. That is part of a sphere. So when she looks into one side, she sees an image of her face that is 30 centimeters in back of the hubcap. She then flips it over. Now, let me pause right there. So I can kind of see a hubcap here that's curved. And so one is concave and the other is convex. And so I'll flip it back and forth. But they don't say at first when she's looking into it whether she's looking into the convex or the concave part. All we know is the second time she looks in it, it's the opposite of the first. All right. So she then flips the hubcap over 
and sees another image of her face, which is 10 centimeters in the back of the hubcap. Okay, how far is her face from the hubcap? Now, also, maybe I ought to point out, if I'm kind of imagining somebody flipping it over, um, you as you flip it over, not only do you go from concave to convex or the other way around, convex to concave, but the radius of curvature is the same. So I can keep that in mind. I can also know that the face is going to be the same distance away if you just kind of flip it over and you don't move it towards you or move it away from you. So I'm going to keep that in mind because as it says, how far is her face from the hubcap? They don't say which direction. Of course not. It's going to be the same. And then, of course, we can also do the radius of curvature of this. So I guess what I'm going to do is something like this. 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F. And maybe I'll call this 1, 1, 1. And so that's the first time uh, she looks into it. Because then when she flips it over, I'd have the same equation. Let me call it number 2 here. But as I was trying to say, there's some things we know about the connection between the first one and the second one. And the first thing I would say is the face is going to be the same distance away from the mirror if you just kind of kind of flip it. Now, the other thing I would say is whatever the focal length was, and again, we don't know if this is plus or minus because you know, we don't, we're not told whether it's convex or concave. So we don't know if that number is positive or negative, but we do know when it is inverted, it is going to have the opposite. Uh, so in other words, if it was positive, and so she was looking into the concave part, and she flips it over, she's now looking into convex. And so the focal length is the negative of what it was before. Or the other way around works also. So I'm gonna say focal length number two is equal in magnitude, but opposite in, in sign as they flip it over. Okay. And then the image distances are given. And so the first time, what does it say here? Um, she looks into one side of the hubcap. She sees an image of her face that is 30. And notice it says in back of the mirror. So that's the virtual side. So mathematically, I'm going to put negative 30. And so this is where those rules I said that are a little noxious, but you got to keep in mind of whether or not, you know, when is Q positive and when it is negative. And it's negative when it's virtual and it's virtual when it's on the side where the light doesn't really go. Uh, your author calls it the back of the mirror. And like I said, that's not a bad description, but I prefer to say where the light doesn't go. That way I can use the same description when I get to lenses. Now, after she flips it over, they, they also say here that uh, there, the, um, let's see, the, another image of her face that's only 10 centimeters, but I think it's still in back of the mirror. So this would be a negative 10. And so looking at this mathematics, you can see I have two equations and two unknowns. And so maybe I'll just solve this one for 1 over P because this would become 1 over F1 plus 1 over 30 when I move it to the other side. And then this one, I'll leave this as a 1 over P because then I will have a minus 1 over F1. And then I move it over, it's plus 1 over 10. And then I'll just set those equal to each other because they're both equal to 1 over P. So this is 1 over F1 plus 1 over 30 equals negative 1 over F1 plus 1 over 10. And if I move this to the other side, I come becomes positive and I have 2 over F1. And here I have 1 over 10 minus 1 over 30, which I guess is a common denominator of 30. 
and uh, let's see, 30 oh, minus 1 there. This would be times 3. So 3 minus 1 makes 2 over 30, uh, which I'm tempted to reduce, but probably be better off just to cancel the 2 on each side, so 1 and 1, and then invert. And so this is saying focal length is 30. And notice it's a positive. So that would tell me the first time she's looking at the concave side. So she's looking to the, the inside piece of the polishing of it. Because then the second one, F2, then is negative 30. When she flips it over, she's looking into the convex side. And then, of course, once we know F1, we can put it into here or over to here and get our P. But maybe I'll just carry this down. So 1 over P equals, and so 1 over F1, which is 1 over 30, plus this 1 over 30, which is 2 over 30, which is 1 over 15, and then I'll invert and 15. And so there it is. Um, and maybe then just kind of as a confirmation um, actually, let me see. Did I did I answer all the the questions? Uh, let's see. A. How far is her face from the hubcap? Okay, so that's the P, fifteen centimeters. And then what is? Oh, the radius of curvature. I guess I technically didn't finish that. So the radius of curvature would be twice the focal length, and so that'd be sixty centimeters. Okay. So yeah, those are the two questions. And like I said, maybe just to kind of confirm, um, I would say with a focal length of 30, I'll put it right there. My thoughts are on the first time, she's looking into it and her face is 15 away. So yes, she would get something that is magnified. That's this scenario right here, so case number three. And uh, that's why it's further back. Because remember, the magnification is Q over P. And so this Q, which they said for the first time is 30, and this is 15. So she's seeing a magnification of 2. It's twice as big. And it's upright. And it's kind of far back into the mirror. And then, of course, the other scenario must look like this. Where her face is only 15, the virtual focal length is here, and so drawing some rays, oops, didn't do a very good job there, we would get something that's close, and that's why it's only 10 centimeters, and uh, it's smaller. In fact, it, it's got to be under the 15 because the magnification has to be less than 1. So, always would have to be under uh, 15, which they said in the second case was 10. So, perfect. I think, we, I think we nailed what's going on here in this scenario, given our pieces of, of information. Okay, uh, let me try another one. Uh, looks like we get away from mirrors. I was thinking maybe these four would be about mirrors, but... Uh, this looks like uh, just a refraction. It's not really a lens yet. I often call it a half lens because the light going from looks like water because we've got a goldfish swimming at two centimeters per second towards the front wall. And this is important, a rectangular aquarium. And then what is the apparent speed of the fish observed, measured by the observer looking from the outside front wall of the tank, the index of refraction of water is about four-thirds. Okay, so coming over here and labeling number 26, uh, let me kind of draw a picture here. So it will be my aquarium wall. Uh, let me start with my fish. I think it said swimming towards it. I almost drew a fish in the wrong direction. A goldfish is swimming towards the front wall. All right, so we have water here and presumably air here. 
uh, we'll have a glass surface that maybe a little added note here. We don't need to worry about if the glass surface is both A, relatively thin, and then B, the faces are parallel, because if you'll notice in some of the homework problems we did, that you were designed to show that the beam would be parallel coming out, or I guess I should say, yeah, if you had air on one side, well, it doesn't matter, as long as it was the same on both here, and so you have a symmetry problem, they come out the same, um, and so that's a nice way of saying that even if you didn't have the stuff on the side, the bending of the light would be equivalent to the first material and the third material, and the parallel piece in between played a very minor, it does have some shearing of the beam, but minor and probably insignificant role. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm not going to worry about the glass in between. I'm just going to say there is this water to air interface. Um, and that might be worth going through, doing something like this, taking a parallel and going, okay, here is air on one side, it hits glass, then it goes into water, and what direction is it going? You will discover it is the same direction as if there was no glass here. And, and that happens because it's parallel. Now, there is a little shearing effect depending on the, and that would depend on how thick this glass is. So that's why I said you, you really would have to say how thick this, this glass is. But what that means for us when we do our homework problems like this, we can just say, mm, it's thin and it's parallel. Therefore, even though we do go from, say, air to glass to water, it's the same thing as just going from air to water. And that's what I'm going to do here. Although I guess it's reversed because I'm going to go from water into air because the light's going to go from the fish to the observer. And so the observer is in the air. So I'll say it again. There's a piece of glass here. I'm going to ignore it and just pretend like some magical wall of water is here and we go from water into air. All right. Now, the reason I guess I wanted to take a, a moment to kind of do this is you might remember N1 over P... Uh, plus N2 over Q, uh, then equals, and I'd see, is it 2 minus 1 or 1 minus 2? I need to, ooh, yeah, it must be 2 minus 1. Let me think this through over the radius of curvature. Uh, in fact, let me grab the book here. Uh, we worked this out in class. Ah, there it is, yeah. So equation 36.8 there. Okay, so I called this the half lens equation because, you know, to make a lens, you have to go through a surface twice. Um, and when we did the lens, we did this. We went from air into glass and then glass into air. And doing this equation twice gave us a very useful equation that if we define the focal length this way, we could still use this particular equation. So that's why we, we did and we have. But in our case, I'm going to just use this one piece, this half lens here. And, of course, it's important to know which way the light is going, and so we're going to start in water. So this is 1.33, and then we have a P, and it's going into the air, and so that's a 1 over a Q. And an important description here was that it was rectangular, so it's like a flat surface, meaning the radius is getting really, really big. And if you take the limit as R goes to infinity, that becomes zero. And so if we kind of rearrange things here and take the inverse, we have a mathematical equation that tells us the connection between where is the, the object and where does it appear to be for the observer 
on the outside. Now, what's interesting about this problem is it goes one step further, which might throw you off, and it's a big reason I picked this problem, is because had they told me where the goldfish was, how far from the glass, you know, let's say they said it was uh, five centimeters from the glass, I could then calculate where it would appear to be from the glass. But that's not what they gave me. They didn't even tell me where it is. They just tell me how fast it's moving. And so I'm going to use my Physics 121 knowledge and take the derivative of both sides. Because knowing positions, I can get velocity equations from that. So I have an equation for positions. By taking its derivative, I now have an equation for velocity. And so let me call this the velocity of the image. And then this, the velocity of the object. That's really what I need here. Because it says here that the goldfish is actually swimming at two centimeters toward. So the real speed of it is two. And then it says, what is the apparent speed? So they want to know the speed of the, the image. Oh, forgot the negative. So this is negative point seven five. And the uh, object speed is two centimeters per second. And so if I take three quarters, 0.75 of two, I get, oh yeah, one and a half. All right. Uh, and it's negative, negative one and a half centimeters per second is the velocity of the image. Now, I suppose we should then say technically we're done, but be careful with the interpretation of the negative because a negative speed just means that you are, you know, traveling in the negative direction, okay? Now, here's why I say that, because the goldfish, oh, sorry, 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 I should have done better with my, ah, I should have done better, sorry. The speed is not a two. The speed is a negative two. Uh, I know that because it says the goldfish is swimming at two centimeters per second towards the front wall. Now, the way I've drawn my picture, you know, you might go, oh, well, it's going to the right, and that's what we call positive. Yeah, when we get to pick our grid, we call X positive that way. But the way I drew it in our meaning of P, our meaning of P is a positive number as it moves away from the inner face. So P is positive in the left direction. So if they're saying it's swimming towards the boundary, and I think this is probably what the author was really trying to get you to see, is that then the speed of the fish needs to be labeled as a negative two using our sign convention. So then we have two negatives multiplying together, meaning that we have a positive. Now, what does a positive mean? Well, positive means the appearance is moving in the positive direction. So let's talk about Q. Remember, our sign convention says Q is positive to the right. And in fact, the fish is in a negative position. That's what this formula would say. So like I said, if they had told me the position of the fish and they gave me something like a positive five, I would then take three quarters of that and get a negative for the position. But see, notice when they say the speed is positive, that means the image of the fish is going in the positive direction. And so I guess what I really want to emphasize here is that given that the speed of the object is a negative two and the speed of the image is a positive 1.5, 
you might think that they're moving in opposite directions, and that's not true. Um, the object is moving to smaller p values. That's why we have a negative speed, which is to the right. And the image is then moving to more positive q values, which again is to the right. And so the fact that we have one positive and one negative doesn't mean they move in opposite directions. Really what it means is our grid of what is a direction for a positive p and what is the direction for a positive q are opposite. And that we could overlook if we're not careful and ah, read the math. There's my chance to, to say it again. And so be careful reading the math. Uh, in fact, I was careless. I did not put the negative 2 here at, at, at first. And I, it needs it. But also, as I read the math, notice that this is not saying they're going in opposite directions. The real object is going to the right, and so is the image. It's just to the right is positive values for the image and going to negative values or lower values for the object. All right, good. So anyways, hope that might have been helpful to someone. Uh, let's look then at my fourth and final one for this video. Um, here it says an object is located 20 centimeters to the left of a diverging lens. That has a focal length of, because so diverging and negative go together. All right. Maybe I'll draw what I have so far. Uh, they only say it's diverging. As we talked about in class, this double concave is a diverging lens. But any lens that had a thicker at the outside than in the inside would diverge. And so something that uh, looked like this, maybe it had just a little bit of curvature, and the second surface has a lot of curvature. And so the light coming in would tend to converge on this first surface and then diverge on the second surface. And given that the second one has more curvature to it, it's stronger than that one, and the net effect is diverging. And so this is a nice pair of glasses to correct for nearsightedness. And, of course, you can also have a plano convex. Well, this is a plane, and then you curve it. I suppose you can even have it the other way around, that you've got the large curvature here and a little bit of curvature there. Although I would argue this and this are the same, because when you f take a lens and flip it around, you end up with uh, surface 2 now becoming surface 1, and surface 1 now becoming surface 2. And because the focal length is this R1 minus this R2, when you flip them, you change the order of them, but you also change the sign of them, and you end up with the same focal length. So whether light goes left to right or right to left, either way, the, the lens is going to have the same... Uh, behavior. It's going to have a focal length on, on each side. Okay, but I digress a little bit from the problem. So let's come back to the, to the problem here. So the object is located 20 centimeters to the left. And so maybe I'll put, whoops, I don't want to put a dot there. I just want to put the object. Because they did put a focal length at 32. So this distance here is 20. And this distance is 32. And then for completeness, let me put a focal length also of 32 on the other side. It matches what I was saying, right going from left to right or right to left, um, hits both surfaces, and the focal length is determined by both surfaces. And then mathematically, you can see both surfaces in the equation. I guess I don't have the n minus 1 in there. All that equals to 1 over f. Okay. Um, however, as we talked about here, the diverging lens, like the diverging mirror, and so that is the concave lens, like the convex mirror, would make the light shoot out 
as if it is coming from that virtual focal point. And light heading towards that virtual focal point gets bent and now goes parallel. So somebody over here would trace these two rays back and maybe say, there's the image. It's right side up, it's smaller, and it's virtual. And that's all that lens can ever do. That lens, the concave lens, is the same as we talked about at the beginning of this video, where we have this convex mirror. Okay. So, coming back to this, this problem here, it says, determine A, the location, and then B, the magnification of the image, and also construct the ray diagram. Oh, so I guess I did C already, as I was kind of just mentally preparing to solve this problem. I actually constructed the ray diagram. So, here's my two rays. And I suppose we could draw the third one. The one that goes through the center is undeviated. But all three of these appear to be coming from right there. And so there's the image. So the image would be then upright. It would be smaller. It would be less than 20. It's closer. And the, the Q value, the position, would be a negative number. And so let me start there. 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F. So in this case, in order to get P, I will take the reciprocal of F subtract off the reciprocal of Q. And the result of all that, I will take the reciprocal. Uh, wait. Wait, wait, wait. My apologies. We know P. We don't know Q. And we're trying to find Q. Okay, let me change this. This is supposed to be a P. Okay. And then this would be the Q. Okay, so the focal length, which is a negative 32, I'm going to take the reciprocal of it, and I'm going to subtract the object distance, which is 20, and I'll take the reciprocal of that, and whatever I get, we'll take the reciprocal. All right, so grabbing my calculator, I'm going to take the negative 32 and take its reciprocal, and then I'm going to subtract a 20 and its reciprocal, I'll hit enter, Take its reciprocal and then get about a negative 12, 12.3. And I guess that's the answer to A, the location. And as we said, it would be a little closer to the lens than the 20. And it would be on the negative side for Q. Uh, so then we can do the magnification which is minus Q over P, so I got a negative, minus the 12.3 centimeters. And then the Q, which is the positive 20. Two negatives make a positive, so there we go. That's why it's going to be upright, and then less than 1. And so 12.3 divided by 20 is about 61%. And there is the magnification. Yay! All right. Oh, good. And I kept that under an hour. And so happy with that. But there's the first four. I'll make you another four a little bit later if you're kind of interested. It'll be the other four on this list, wherever my list went. But uh, I'll call it quits for now. Take care.